Welcome back to Calculus 1, Math 2413. Um, this is Lecture 1.4 on Calculating Limits. In the last class, we looked at some of the rules around limits, or the limit laws. And um, <clears throat> so here we're uh, saying that there's two functions. As the limit as x goes to a of f of x, and the limit as x of a, as x goes to a of g of x, both exist. Then remember that the limit of a sum is equal to the sum of the limits. So we can take the limit of each part and add those. Um, number two is saying the limit of a difference between functions is equal to the difference between the limits. Number three is saying that if we're taking the limit of a constant times a function, this is equal to the constant times the limit. If we're taking the limit of a product, uh, we can take the product of the limits. And we also saw that if we have a quotient, the limit of a quotient, um, rule five says that we can, this is equivalent to the quotient of the limits, okay? So we can apply the limit to each piece. These are pretty intuitive. The only one rule is that, of course, the denominator cannot equal zero. Okay, and we're actually going to look at what happens in some of the cases that we can't do these um, because mainly because we'll have a, a zero denominator, which means a function or that value doesn't exist. Okay, let's look at some more. Okay, so if we are taking the limit of a function raised to an integer um, or an, a constant, if you will, a positive integer, one, two, three, etc. Um, this is equal to the limit of the function. We can take the limit of the function first and then raise it to an integer. We already talked about the limit of a constant is constant because the constant can't change. And then the limit um, as x goes to a of x, if we just have the variable x, then of course it's going to be a, assuming that a exists. Um, and then if we have the limit of as x goes to a of x raised again to an integer, um, this is equal to a to the nth power, or whatever we're um, approaching. The limit as x goes to a of the nth root of x is equal to the nth root of a. Again, where this is a positive integer. Sorry, one more. And then if we are, we're applying the limit of the nth root of f of x of a function, Notice that we can take the root, the nth root of the limit of that function. So again, we can apply it inside. Um, both of these are saying if it's an even root, remember that we're talking about um, real numbers here, so that everything inside the um, the the even root would have to be positive. We can't take a square root of a negative number. Nothing times itself will be negative, and we're not talking about imaginary numbers, not yet anyway. All right, so let's look at um, some problems using these laws, and we'll demonstrate them, okay? So first we have the limit of 2x squared minus 3x plus 4. So notice we have a difference here in a sum, and remember that we are allowed to take the different, or excuse me, the limit of each of the parts. So this is by laws 1 and 2, the law of a sum, and the law of a difference. So we can take the limits of each part. In the first one, we have a constant times x um, squared. In the second one, we have constant times x. And so remember, we can pull those constants out in front. These are both by rule 3. Okay, The limit of, um, as x goes to 5 of 2x squared, we can pull that constant out in front. And same in the second term. Now here we have two versions. We actually have three different rules, right? We have x to a power of n, in this case n is 2. We have just the limit of x, and then we also have the limit of a constant. And so we have three rules here. So remember that x to the n, as x goes to a, we just plug in the a value there and, and can solve. Um, the limit is x of, um, the limit of, as x goes to a of, of just x, is equal to that x. Remember this is rule, I think eight, and then the last one, the limit of a constant is always that constant. So now we just do the arithmetic and we get 39. So we used pretty much almost every law that we just went through there. Sum in a difference, the limit of x to a power of n, the limit of x, the limit of a constant, and then we just plug in the values and solve. Okay, so 
Let's look at another problem, okay? Let's look at B here. The limit as x goes to negative 2 of x cubed plus 2x squared minus 1 all divided by the quantity of 5 minus 3x. Remember that when we have the limit of a quotient, this is equal to the quotient of the limit. So this is law number 5. So we can take the limit of the numerator and the limit of the denominator. But remember, there's a rule that says we can only do this if the denominator will not equal 0. If we plug in negative 2 for x, the denominator will not equal 0, so this is allowed. Okay. Now we have a sum, a difference, and a difference, so we can separate all the parts. Okay, We've done that here. Anything that has a constant, we can pull it out in front of the limit. Notice that the limit of 3x is 3 times the limit of x. The limit of 2x squared is 2 times the limit of x squared. I know I'm going through this fast, but you know that's the, the beauty of video. <clears throat> excuse me, is that you can pause at any time and kind of walk through those pieces or rewind and hear me again. I'm not sure that I'd like that, but anyway. So finally, now that we have all these pieces, um, we're using the rest of the laws. The law of x to the power of n is a to the power of n, so negative 2 cubed. Um, same rule here, negative 2 squared. Uh, the limit of a constant is just the constant 1. Uh, again, a constant 5. And then the limit of x, we just plug in the a value, which is negative 2. Now we're at an arithmetic part, and we just do the arithmetic, and we get negative 1 over 11. Now one of the things you may want to be doing as you're going through these problems is if you feel confident that you can do them before watching me do them, or um, pause the video and try to work it out for yourself on some scratch paper, and then watch the video and see if you got the right answer. Or maybe why, if you're not so sure what to do, try the first problem, watch me do it, and then, or excuse me, watch for the first problem, and then maybe try the second problem on your own. Okay, most of this course I'll be doing um, two things. One is I really want you to get the context of um, calculus, and we started with that about instantaneous change and accumulated change. And then, of course, I'm going to be doing problems to help you figure out how we apply this. So we talked about this too, we just didn't name it last in the last lecture, and this is the direct substitution property. This says if f is a polynomial, remember polynomials are continuous over all values of x, or it's a rational function, and a is in the domain of f, so you know rational functions often have asymptotes where they're undefined, but it's saying that um, a is in the domain of, of f in both of these. Then the limit of f of x equals f of a. All this is saying is that if a function is continuous through a, that means there's no hole there, that means there's no jump there, then the limit as x goes to a of that function is going to be just the value when you plug in a into the function because it exists and it's continuous. So this works for all continuous functions, and I should say functions that are continuous at a, wherever we're going towards, right, what we're looking for the limit at. So functions that are continuous at a, this will always be the case, and this also includes trig functions. Okay, so not everything can be solved by the laws. Isn't that a truth for all of us in the real world, too, that laws don't solve everything? So sometimes we have to solve limits analytically. So notice um, in example two here in green, the limit as x goes to 1. If we plugged 1 in, normally we would um, use the quotient rule, right? The limit of the numerator, the limit of the denominator. But remember, that doesn't work um, because we, if we plug 1 in, the denominator becomes 0. And we can't have a 0 in the denominator of a fraction or rational expression because it doesn't exist, right? You cannot divide by 0. The old rule I used to always say is 0 is your friend. Don't lock him in the basement, okay? So we have to try something else. We cannot just say that this doesn't exist until we try something first. Um, and so what we're going to try here is maybe some factoring. Notice the numerator is the difference of two perfect squares. And hopefully you remember factoring. If not, there's some algebraic review in, in WebAssign, um, some earlier chapters or a review chapter. Anyway, remember that the difference between two squares is the sum of the square roots 
times the difference of the square roots. So x squared minus 1 can be factored into x plus 1 times x minus 1. Notice now that we have the same factor in the numerator and denominator, so we can cancel out the x minus 1. And we get simply the limit as x goes to 1 of x plus 1, which of course is now a continuous function. We could take the limit as x goes to 1 of x plus the limit as x goes to 1 of 1, or we can, since we know this is continuous, we can just plug it in now. And 1 plus 1 equals 2. I wish I had um, printed off the graph here, but if you, you can put this in your calculator and see the graph. Um, and although it doesn't exist at, at um, x equals 1, you'll see that there's a hole there if you have a newer graphing calculator. But it does approach 2 um, with the hole in that spot. All right. So here we have another case where if we plug in the limit, the value of a, the denominator goes to 0, um, which of course again makes this undefined, and so we're not sure what's going on. We can't apply the quotient rule because the denominator will be 0. Okay, so here if we multiply it out, and remember this is not 9 plus h squared, this is a FOIL, so you have to do the full FOIL here. If we multiply 3 plus h squared, or 3 plus h times 3 plus h, we get 9 plus 6h plus h squared minus 9. Dropping the parentheses and solving this, notice the 9's go away, and we just get 6h plus h squared over h. Notice there's a, a common factor of h here. If we factor h out of the numerator, we'll get h times 6 plus h over h, and then those two h's can cancel out, and we simply get 6 plus h. If we apply the limit now, the limit as h goes to 0 of 6 plus h, well, as h goes to 0, this goes away, and we just get 6. Okay. All right, let's try one that's a little more complicated. Once again, the denominator is going to 0. But now we have a, a square root up top, the square root of t squared plus 9 minus 3. So this is where calculus gets a little tricky, and I say it gets a little gamey. And what I mean by that is not the taste of wild meat, but um, that you have to kind of approach calculus sometimes as if you're playing a video game. Um, and I'm not a big video gamer. I'm not a gamer at all. But I've tried some things. You know when you go into a room and you're trying to find something, and you open a box and you open a cabinet, and so you keep trying things until hopefully you find something. So in calculus, you want to look for things and patterns and remember things that you did before. Now, before when we had something like this in the denominator, if we had the square root of t squared plus 9 minus 3 in the denominator, we'd have to rationalize it because we're not allowed to have square roots in the denominator. Sorry about that, guys. I have a thing with clocks and chimes, and so you're getting to hear that in the background. It's 4 o'clock an hour before happy hour, so I'll stick with it if you will too. Anyway, so again, we're looking for patterns, and although this isn't in the denominator, it, it would help us get rid of the square root. So try some things, even though they may not be in the right place or um, in the same place that you were taught. So notice if I multiply the top of this by the square root of t squared plus 9 plus 3, then I get the square of the first minus um, the square of the second, right? A sum and a difference times itself is the square of the first term minus the square of the second term, okay? Now remember, I can't just multiply the numerator by that because now I'm changing the value of the function. So I have to multiply the numerator and the denominator by the same term because now I'm just simply multiplying this rational expression by 1, and anything times 1 is itself. So as long as I multiply the top and the bottom by the same thing, I'm not actually changing the value of the function. So again, remember that when I have a sum times the difference of the same terms, I get the square of the first term minus the square of the second term. So the square of a square root is just what's inside, or the radicand, minus 3 squared, which is 9. And then in the bottom, I just get this function t squared times all of that stuff. All right. If I clean this up a bit, again, dropping the parentheses, notice I have t squared plus 9 minus 9. Well, plus 9 minus 9 is 0, so that goes away. 
and I simply have the limit as t squared, um, excuse me, as t goes to zero of t squared over t squared times this function thing. Well, notice the t squareds now canceled out. Remember, they can I can't cancel out like this one in there because it's being added and all that crap. We can only cancel things out. Cancellation is a division um, function which only cancels out products. Right? Division is the opposite of multiplication, so I can only cancel out things that are being multiplied in numerators and denominators. So the t squareds canceled out, and I get the limit as t goes to zero of one over the square root of t squared plus 9 plus 3. Notice now, if I plug in the 0, I do no longer get, um, what am I trying to say? I no longer get 0 in the denominator. So I could now apply the limit rules. And we're kind of doing that here without actually saying that we're doing it. Um, uh, in, in this case, actually, I'm sorry, they did apply their limit rule. They applied the limit inside of, inside of the uh, radical here. So here's one limit rule. We could have also used the quotient rule, which means the limit of the constant. Of course, we know that equals the constant. So once you get familiar with these rules, we kind of do shortcuts. You know, I, we don't always make you show what 3 times 2 is, that kind of thing. All right, so we pull the limit inside, and now we can even separate these. And then the limit as t goes to 0 of t squared plus 9, and we can... Uh, is the limit of t squared plus the limit of 9, but 9 is a constant, so it stays there. Um, the limit of t to the n power, remember we substitute in the 0 for t, and or a, you know, that idea, and then raise it to that power. So 0 squared is just 0. So we get the square root of 9, because 0 plus 9 is 9, and then the square root of 9 is simply 3. So I get 1 over 3 plus 3, which equals 1 over 6. Again, I know I'm walking through this fast. I'm not actually having to write this stuff, so it may seem too fast, but you, again, have the option of rewinding or pausing. All right. Let's look at a couple more things, and then we'll be done this lecture. Uh, we're going to look at limit theorems. The first one we've already talked about, and this says, um, in order for a limit to exist, it only it, it exists if and only if the limit as we come from the negative direction from the negative direction equals that limit value, which also equals the limit as we come from the positive direction. So this is saying in order for a limit to exist, both one-sided limits have to exist and they have to be the same value. All right. Now this is kind of interesting. It, this says if f of x is less than g of x when x is near a, remember this is what the value we're looking at. So if f of x is below g of x when x is near a, um, and both limits exist, then the limit of f of x will also be less than the limit of g of x. And that's pretty intuitive. I wish these were next to each other. So if f of x is less than g of x near a, then the limit is x goes to a of f of x is going to be less than g of x. And you can see that visually here, um, although it's in reverse here. Here we have, oh, no we don't, I'm sorry, f of x is less than g of x. So here's f of x, the blue is g of x, and you can see that f of x is below there, and when we're at a, um, this is actually demonstrating another principle, if it was below it, then the limit would also be below it. This is demonstrating the squeeze theorem, and I think it may help you understand this. So now we're just kind of taking limit, or excuse me, theorem 3 and adding another element. So if we have something that is above and below the function, okay, and so we, here we have f of x is less than g of x is less than h of x. f of x is less than g of x is less than h of x, okay? And this again is the concept when we're near a, okay? These could, as you can see, they change when we get over here. So we're talking about some proximity to this limit value or this value of x that we're asking about, okay? And if this is true, and if the outer sides, if, f of, if the limit of f of x equals the limit of h of x, and they're equivalent and they both equal l, then because g of x is between there, it also has to equal L, and that certainly makes sense. What we're talking about is two functions converging. So if H converges on it to L, and F converges to L, and G is between them at the same time, this is called the squeeze theorem, and you can even kind of see it. It looks like the functions are squeezed together at that value of A, and um, X equals A. 
And so this can help us solve some difficult equations, and I'm, we're going to do one right now about how to use that. All right. So notice now we have a trig function. Hopefully your trig is um, in good shape. Actually, I'm going to give you a little warning here. If it's been a while since you've done trig, go get a book. Go watch Khan Academy. Do some stuff so that you remember your trig. There's a lot of trig in this course. Um, buy trig for dummies, whatever it takes. But you need to be able to do uh, to, to remember your trig functions. There is a lot of trig in calculus. All right, let's move on. So here we have the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared times the sine of 1 over x. All right. We can't really use the product law because if we do that, the limit is of x squared. That's fine. But the limit um, of sine 1 over x becomes undefined because, again, we have 1 over 0. Um, and so this becomes undefined. <clears throat> now, we can use the squeeze theorem here. Now, remember the idea behind the squeeze theorem is that when you're going to something and that you have um, outer limits that could possibly be the same, okay? Um, or you're, you're looking for, um, again, three functions that are between two values. Well, what is, we know that sine goes between negative 1 and 1. So it's already kind of a natural setup, right? That the, the value of sine for values uh, of anything, the sine of anything, goes between negative 1 and 1. So notice we can set up this part of the equation as an inequality. Negative 1 is less than or equal to sine 1 over x, which is less than or equal to 1, because we know that sine only goes between negative 1 and 1. Well, that's not our function, and we really want our function to be in here. So notice if we multiply all three pieces by x squared, we then get negative x squared, is less than or equal to x squared times the sine 1 over x, which is less than or equal to, the, to 1 times x squared. Remember, that's allowed. As long as we multiply both sides of an equation, or an equation, which is what we have here, inequality, then we're okay. We haven't changed the fundamental nature of the inequality. Remember, the only time we change anything with an inequality when we're multiplying is if we multiply by a negative. Here, we just multiplied everything by x squared. <clears throat> Now, let's apply the limits to this. Well, notice the, we're talking about the limit as x goes to 0. Well, following our limit laws, the, the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared is 0 squared, or 0. And the limit as x goes to 0 of negative x squared, again, is negative 0 squared, which, of course, is also 0. So notice that what we have on both sides of the equation, oops, on both sides of this equation is that um, 0 is less than or equal to the limit uh, as x goes to 0 of our original function, which is less than or equal to 0. And all it's saying is that this function ha is between 0 and 0, so the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared sine 1 over x equals 0. One more thing before we leave. Notice um, in this example there's a big V before the example. What this is, and I've copied this, actually, I printed this right out of your text, your electronic and enhanced text. You should check out your textbook, um, especially if you can read the sections before you watch the videos or after them. But this tells you that there's a video that's connected to this problem. You might also see a little monitor, which means there's probably a slideshow or animation. But these are really good, and so if you don't quite get what I'm talking about, Go into your electronic text inside of WebAssign. Go to section 1.4, which is what this video is about. Go to example 9 and click on the video, and you have another instructor to show it to you.